This meeting is being recorded. Hi, everybody. Tim Anderson here. Thanks for being with us today. We appreciate it very much. We're glad you're here today for this conversation because, as you can see, we're here with Craig Morley. Now, Craig is a sitting member of the ASB, but he is not here today in that capacity. Uh, Craig is here today as Craig. Now, he's also the uh, 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 a president ex officio of the National Association of Appraisers. He was the chairman of NARS uh, appraisal section. He was on the Utah State Appraisal Board. He chaired the Utah State Appraisal Board, but he's not here today in any of those capacities. He is here as an informed, concerned appraiser. Now, Craig, you've been doing this um, practically as long as I have, which is you know, well over 35 years. So we've got a little we, we've got a little experience of what's going on. Let's talk some more today about uh, topics we've talked about before in some depth, but this topic is so big, we could talk about it numerous times for numerous hours. And we're talking about the, the current political climate relative to bias and discrimination. And uh, before, before we went on the air and in other conversations, we've talked about the fact that uh, uh, real estate appraisal is uh, under attack and uh, we are being charged with uh, being systemically and endemically biased and discriminating against uh, uh, people of color. So uh, let's talk. Let's continue to talk about that, Craig. And I'm I'm not trying to proclaim that we're innocent. I mean, appraisers are probably as biased as any other group of people. But um, the uh, ability to have real estate appraisals done, which you got to have if you're going to buy a house with a mortgage is under attack right now. So let's talk a little bit about this. We, we've all read the cases about the uh, uh, black couple that, uh, and, I'm, and I'm using that in its generic sense, the black couple that wants their house appraised, a white appraiser comes in, um, appraises the house, quote unquote, low. Then the, uh, uh, the, the black couple complains. Another appraiser, usually white, uh, comes in later and magically the value of the house has gone up significantly. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about fairness. Let's talk about uh, why is the first appraisal always wrong and the second appraisal always higher uh, is right. Uh, let's talk about the fact that there's been no testing on this. We've not been able to see any of the appraisals to see, to, to judge their quality, to subject them to a standard 3-4 review. We've not had anybody talk about the what goes on between the appraisals. And as you and I mentioned earlier, all of the stories that we hear are essentially the same thing, no matter where we hear them which means basically what you read from the New York Times and the Washington Post and the uh, Chicago Tribune and the San Francisco Chronicle, blah, 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 is just an echo of one instance. So let's talk about fairness here for a little while. Uh, how fair is this? Let, let's start out with the fairness issue. How fair is this this charge, and I put that in quotes because they're, uh, the real estate appraisal itself can't be sued. But how fair is this charge against us? Well, to, to be clear, it's, it's a problem when you have two appraisers appraising the same property and coming up with significantly different results. And, and so on, on its face, you see that and you think, this is a serious problem. The, the problem that uh, we haven't really, and as you have, have, have outlined, the, the, the issue that we've never really addressed is, number one, is this a competency problem or is it a racial bias problem? The fact is we don't know. And uh, the, the, the thing that you have alluded to is there's several issues that have never really been appropriately addressed to be able to get to the bottom of these disparities that you find. The thing, the, the fairness issue, the thing that bothers me the most is the assumption that the high appraisal is always right and the low appraisal is always wrong. And that uh, it's the, the reason why the, the justification for it is, is bias. 
What we don't know, and this is the thing that I would love to see a, a, a detailed analysis of, is we, we routinely hear this idea that uh, they went in and whitewashed the home. What did, and, and you know, that, that on its face, well, we removed any evidence of our ethnicity so that uh, it, it became kind of a uh, plain, indis, you know, in, indiscernible kind of uh, home as, as far as the occupants of the property. What we don't know is were there other things done? Did they clean the carpets? Did they paint? Did they do other things that materially changed the condition of the home? Now, I can tell you, having looked at thousands of properties, you've got some folks that uh, when the appraiser comes by, the house is a wreck. You know, they haven't vacuumed, they haven't cleaned, it, it, it doesn't look very well. And then you'll have some, like your and my wife, who if they think somebody's coming over, uh, you know, they're, they're getting the disinfectant out, they're vacuuming and cleaning and making sure everything looks pristine. And, uh, and, and, and I can just about guarantee that uh, if you send the same person through, one is, is a wreck, stuff everywhere, and the other one is clean and, and looks nice, it, it's going to show, it's going to, to be perceived a little bit differently from anyone that goes in and looks at the property. Now, will it have a material impact on the quality and condition ratings? It probably shouldn't. But human nature is that uh, may, maybe it does. And, and the reality is, I don't know if those things happened or not. But it would be nice to look at the photos of uh, both appraisals and try to determine, was there a material difference in the condition of the property between the two? And, and if there was, that might explain some difference. The other element that uh, we never hear very frequently, occasionally I've heard reference in some of the complaints that I've read, where you get an idea of the timeline, how much time took place between the two appraisals. But, but you and I both know that uh, we have seen a market that is unprecedented in our lifetimes in terms, you know, from about uh, the, the beginning of the pandemic and, you know, the late uh, 2019 through about uh, the first quarter of 2022, we have never seen the kind of rapid appreciation take place that has taken place in many sec, you know, market sections of the mark of, of the U.S., and so a, a month or two could completely change the data set uh, that would be available from one appraiser to the next. And in markets where you were seeing, in some cases, a couple of percent change within that period, and if an appraiser is maybe not as careful in appropriately analyzing market condition differences, you could end up with a material difference in value simply due to the differences in the data that might be available from the first to the second appraisal, especially if that time period is more than a couple of months. You know, and the third thing that we don't know is how was that second, you know, that second appraiser selected? Or for that matter, matter were there more than one appraisal obtained and then they use the highest one. You know, I remember back in the battle days in the early 2000s where mortgage lenders would go hire three and four and five appraisers to do appraisals and then they would use the highest one and submit it. And uh, in fact, it was kind of a funny story. A, a friend of mine calls me up, he's complaining because uh, he can't get the mortgage company to, uh, to pay him for an appraisal he performed on a mortgage loan. And so when he calls the loan officer, the loan officer says, dude, you are the worst appraiser that I've ever seen. We had six appraisals done on this property and you were the lowest. I'm not going to pay you for this. And, and, you know, you wonder, is that same kind of filtering going on in the selection of this second appraiser? You know, how, how, was it a random selection? Did the, the borrower select the appraiser? Did the lender select the appraiser? Did the lender select the appraiser on the basis of past reputation for maybe being a little more uh, generous on their values? Did the second appraiser receive information saying, hey, we had a, the first appraisal done on this was terrible. It was so low. We need to get a good appraiser to come in and appraise this for what it ought to be. You know, kind of the code words to say, hey, get this thing up there. 
we don't know if those kinds of things happened, but if they did, it could have a re, uh, it could affect the results of this. And so the idea, you know, this this whole idea of fairness is to hear these anecdotal stories with no real significant factual background as to the circumstances associated with the ordering and and uh, the the differences between the two. Uh, to just assume that, well, obviously this was racial bias, when in fact it could be other things. And, and very likely you could have market condition differences, you could have competency issues, and uh, it, it kind of feels like that nobody cares what the real problem is. We just want it to be this problem, and we want this to be the reason why. And uh, it's pretty hard to solve a problem if you don't know really what the underlying issues are. So that, that's, that's kind of the position that I've been coming from. I'm concerned about and worry about the fairness element as how the appraisal profession is being uh, maligned by anecdotal stories that may or may not have substance to them. Uh, Craig, you raised the issue of competency and then you've also raised the issue of fairness. So let's talk about that for a second. Um, is it possible, is it just within the realm of reason that there are some political motivations here and the first appraiser is, cho is chosen specifically because he or she isn't competent and then the second appraiser is chosen because he or she has already indicated that he or she will come in at a higher value? Is, is, that, even, is that even imaginable? Well, there are certainly circumstances where that could be the case. You know, the reality is we don't know uh, the, the, the backstory on any of these cases. And uh, the thing that as appraisers that we need to do I think is that we need to be what I guess maybe more cautious in how we communicate our assignment results. I, I think that one of the things that gives legs to these stories of uh, bias is some of the word choices people make in describing a neighborhood, trying to explain why there's differences in various features associated with the property. And when we use some of this uh, coded language that, you know, may, maybe we use those terms innocently, it doesn't mean the same thing to me as it does to someone else. But uh, it, when we get to a point where we are trying to talk about the ethnicity of a neighborhood or, or any of those kinds of people characteristics that that it, within the body of the report, you're setting yourself up for a bias claim. It just, it's just, we're appraising the property, not the people. And we have got to get beyond that point of trying to attribute characteristics of property to characteristics of people. And uh, when we do that, when we come in and say, well, this characteristic exists within this neighborhood because of a particular class of people that live there, that, that's just really uh, 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 an invitation for a complaint on the basis of uh, some kind of inappropriate, uh, illegal, unethical bias that uh, we need to try to avoid. Let's continue on with the uh, concept of uh, competency in light of what you just said. So the appraiser, uh, for example, puts into the report, the subject property is in a good neighborhood. Of course, the word good in this context has no meaning whatsoever. And because it has no particular meaning, its meaning can be interpreted in the worst possible way, which would be a code word, meaning a white neighborhood or a wealthy neighborhood, ergo, uh, there aren't any black people there. And, or and I shouldn't say that, I should say any people of color there, nor would they be welcome if they tried to get in. So instead of saying the subject is in a good neighborhood or even worse, the subject is in a bad neighborhood, um, what is it the appraiser should uh, communicate instead? Now, I'm not talking about bias, 
But rather than saying the subject is in a good neighborhood, what is it that the appraiser can say that implies the market is willing to pay a premium to live in this neighborhood over another neighborhood, which is, which is totally looking at the market, not looking at the people in it. So what, how does the appraiser communicate that the market has a higher desire for neighborhood X relative to neighborhood Y, which has nothing to do with race, but has everything to do with location or school system, or uh, it's got a beautiful view of the ocean or a beautiful view of the mountains or a beautiful view of a golf course or whatever. How, how are appraisers supposed to communicate that difference without using the subjective judgmental terms of good, average, fair, poor? You know, Tim, my, in my experience in looking at many, many appraisals, we as appraisers tend to assume people know what we're talking about when we use some of these words. And we don't do a very good job of providing detailed explanations uh, that, that would lead people to the same conclusion that we have having seen the property and the area. And so the if I'm trying to come up with a canned comment, which I think is really where a lot of this problem lies, is that we've come up with comments that we just replicate over and over again without real thought as to, are we painting a verbal picture that someone else could understand when they read it or not? And often it's, or not, we, we don't. And so if I were going to try to, uh, rather than use good neighborhood, I, I might go in and say, this neighborhood has a large public park, the, the, there's three public schools within a mile, or shoppings within six blocks, or there's lots of neighborhood amenities, or this neighborhood has outperformed all of the other neighborhoods in terms of either price appreciation or in sales, making it a uh, an area that ha has a, a large number of people looking to move into the area, which is, you know, and, and so we, we can talk about it in terms of the actual uh, market behavior and the physical characteristics that in, in our minds help us to understand, well, yeah, this, this is better than something that doesn't have the same kinds of features. And as a result, the market responds accordingly. And so, you know, one of the things that I will try to look at is predominant values. You know, if I go into an area and predominant values are low, low meaning they're they're on the within the spectrum of, of the overall uh, city or, or community, if they're in the lower 10, 15 percent, and then I'm going to an area where they're in the mid range of uh, what uh, properties are typically at or the high end uh, the, the price that people are willing to pay for similar sized homes may vary from one to the next so if i have a large you know a, a home that is 2000 square feet in an area where the predominant size is is a thousand square feet i might have some issues with the uh with with marketability and, and, and economic issues that uh, would affect how much someone would pay for that home in that neighborhood. If I have that exact same home in an area where the typical size is 3,000 square feet, you may see that people would pay more for that home. And, and why is that? It, 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 it's not that the home or you know the physical improvements are any different from one to the next. It, it clearly has something to do with the location, but is the location based on some protected class or characteristic, or is it just simply the economics where people look at this and say, you know what, I'd rather have a small home in a big neighborhood than a big home in a small, you know, in a smaller home neighborhood. And, and the, the price, there may be a price difference. There may not be too, I don't know. But, but in my experience, in most of the areas that I've been involved with, there tends to be a difference there. And so if we are going to go in and make adjustments for differences in location, I think I would be trying to explain factually why 
there is a location difference one neighborhood has lots of community amenities the other one doesn't the market will pay a little bit of a premium to have access to those amenities over the ones that don't and usually you can bear that out by the day that you can look at sales and say yeah this the homes in this area are selling for a little bit more than the homes in that neighborhood all things being equal and so I've got support for location difference that I can apply but the minute I start referring to the ethnic makeup or anything else I have now communicated to my client a possibility a code word of possible bias that can create some problems for us I guess I better unmute my microphone before I talk um, let's um, continue with this concept of, of competency now you mentioned earlier uh, boilerplate and appraisers like to use boilerplate because it saves time and it does frankly now uh, I got to, I was sitting here at my desk like one night doing whatever it is I do and I got a phone call and it was like 9 30 at night and so uh, I answered it and it was an appraiser whom I had never met before uh, and who was challenging me on something I had written in a op-ed piece I had written some time before and the uh, and when I say op-ed piece it was you know, it, it wasn't a newspaper or something like that it was just a, an article I wrote for a magazine and it was you know, my opinion and I was condemning the extensive use of water plate and this appraiser very politely very respectfully uh, climbed all over my case saying that you know for three four hundred bucks an appraiser did not have the time to go into the kind of analysis that I was were talking about in the article and that you were just talking about in in your statement so and this goes this goes back to competency so, Craig, are we shooting ourselves in the foot because we're not willing to take time to understand what's going on in the market area? Are we shooting ourselves in the foot because we're trying to overuse boilerplate in an attempt to save time? And if we are overusing boilerplate in an attempt to save time, is this a competency issue that can be overcome with greater education or is this uh, a, an issue of a false sufficiency that is going to come back to bite us really hard you know i think an the answer is yes it's a competency problem uh, nothing wrong with using appropriate boilerplate the problem is that you have to take the time to make sure that the comments you're providing are specific to the property and they're appropriate to the assignment. So frequently what we see with boilerplate is you have information that is being provided by the appraiser that is completely irrelevant to the assignment that you're performing. And, and in some cases it's, it's conflicting with the, you know, with, with other statements within the report. So if you want to set yourself up for someone to make a claim and state agencies that are investigating this stuff love to see these conflicting statements because it's an automatic uh, misleading report, right? I mean, I say one thing in one section of the report, I say something else in another, uh, and uh, it, 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 it's a problem. Right now, it becomes particularly important to make sure that we're using factual economic information you know, if I'm using a report as a template that I had done six months ago or nine months ago when the market was heated and prices were going up and I failed to go in and change the description of market characteristics and I show everything as being, you know, super duper fast, rapid, short marketing times, very little inventory. Well, in many markets, that's simply not the case. And by using that information, I'm telling my client that the market is different than it may actually be. And, and I, I've got to fix that. I, I've got to change that. And so the question you have to ask yourself is, is my boilerplate 
accurate in terms of describing both the neighborhood characteristics and the market conditions within the neighborhood. I, I, I've mentioned this to you before, but uh, years ago, we had someone come in for a uh, experience uh, review that had been denied for a trainee. And uh, they had four appraisals that they had submitted. And, and these were all over the state. They, these were not in the same area. And the neighborhood description was exactly the same. The, the property values were exactly the same. Everything in all four appraisals was exactly the same on page one of the uh, 1004 appraisal report form. And you look at that and, you know, appraisers sometimes think, well, that, that, that doesn't really affect my assignment results. I mean, the value is good. You know, that's kind of the thing I hear. Oh, well, the value is good. What's the problem? Well, you know, the, the lender is using this appraisal as a tool to assess risk. And when I describe things incorrectly about the neighborhood, market conditions, or the property, I have essentially told them things that they are using in assessing the risk of the property for making that loan that are factually incorrect. And it may result in them making a loan or, or pricing that loan in such a way that if they had the correct information, they wouldn't have done. And so I think realistically, uh, using uh, nothing wrong with boilerplates as long as it's relevant to the assignment and it pertains to the property. But the, the more frequently, the problem is that it's not. And, and we get bleed throughs that to cause us all kinds of problems. Uh, Craig, let's uh, stay on the issue of uh, bias and discrimination, but let's look at it from a little bit different uh, standpoint right now. Uh, there are about, uh, 80-ish thousand appraisers uh, in the United States right now. And if I recall the figures correctly, about half of those are actively involved in appraising real estate. So let, let's say 40,000 appraisers actively involved in, in appraising real estate. When you look at the number of attorneys, number of doctors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, real estate brokers. We are not a large organization and there is no single large organization that represents us. Even NAR, uh, which has know, umpty gump zillion members, has I think about 30,000 um, real estate appraisal members. So uh, we don't have a central group advocating for us or standing up for us, etc. Now, given the fact that we are weak uh, as, a, as an industry, is what is going on in real estate appraisal right now politically motivated because those who are criticizing us know we can't and therefore won't fight back? You know, here, here's the thing that we do know is we know that the, uh, the, the current administration is very concerned about bias. Uh, we, we know that uh, the, they, they've undertaken this paved task force, which has conclusions that uh, suggest there's some major reforms that need to be made. Right or wrong, and you can debate that. But uh, you know they, they've they've got a large number of agencies. They've gone in and studied this, and what they are finding, and this this is true, is that the appraisal profession is made up largely of white men. I mean that's just the reality, and and uh, that there's a concern that we don't have the kind of diversity within the profession that exists within society. Now, here, here's the complaint and the frustration that I have is that I think we're making some very good uh, inroad in diversifying the, the appraiser population, but the appraisal subcommittee has no way to track this. So we don't know how many trainees or, or uh, people are entering the profession. We have no idea what the ethnicity of these folks are. And so we won't know I'm not sure we'll even know when they show up on the appraisal registry because there's not really any kind of, that I've seen at least, any kind of uh, declaration of ethnicity 
uh, with the, other than I think you can identify men and women. But beyond that, I don't know if that's even uh, I, it's been a while since I've looked at uh, the, the, the posting there. You've got your name, your credential and uh, and uh, and, the, and your status on the registry. And beyond that, I don't know that they know. But in, in my anecdotal experience, uh, is that there are a lot more diverse people coming into the profession. I think we're solving some of these problems that the PAVE task force has criticized us for, but the problem is we still get the criticism because we don't have a way to effectively measure whatever progress it is we may be making. I think the other issue that we have is that uh, there's just the assumption, and this is a little bit offensive to me, but you know, the assumption that, well, just because you've got a lot, a lot, a uh, large population of uh, white appraisers, that uh, they are just automatically biased. And that if we had more diversity, that it would solve the problem. People have biases. There's no way around it. You know, you may like, uh, I may like chocolate ice cream. You may not. We all have preferences that, uh, that we, that, that we, that we like. When it comes to appraisal bias, the issue is having, you know, do our, do our biases affect the assignment results? Are we, are we allowing our personal preferences to color our opinion and, and in ways that are either unethical or illegal? And uh, so as we start looking at this problem that exists within the, the profession is that we need to do a better job of, uh, uh, of trying to eliminate the perception of being biased uh, beyond what's just part of human nature. And I, I'll give you a kind of an illustration. Uh, a few years ago, we had a task force where we were trying to look into some of these claims of, of racial bias. And we had a couple of uh, agents of color from around the country that we would interview. And the question was, do you think that there is a racial bias in, in appraising? And the answer was almost uniformly, yes, we do think there is. And would say, okay, what's the case study? Show us, give us an illustration where this happened. And, and the illustration, you know, would, would routinely be something like this. I have a, I have a uh, client who's black, who has been involved in inner city uh, urban, you know, urban neighborhoods where they're remodeling homes and reselling them. And uh, they, uh, 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 you know, kind of this typical you and me kind of a old white guy gets the assignment to do the appraisal and the appraiser or the uh, agent says, listen, my client has remodeled several homes in this area let me provide you with uh, some of the sales data on these properties that might assist you in performing the appraisal. And the appraiser says, no, thank you. I will do this myself. I'm perfectly capable of finding my own comparable sales. Well, as fate would have it, the appraiser selects comparable sales, comes in below the contract price, and what do you think the percent and, and, and in talking with the agent, the agent says the sales that I provided were more recent and closer to the property that was the subject of the appraisal than what the appraiser ended up selecting. So from the appraiser, from, from the, the, the broker's perspective, yeah, this appraiser is biased. Now you and I might look at it and say, no, I think this is a competency problem. I don't think, you know, they, they may or may not like the people they're dealing with. We don't know that. And it's almost impossible to prove that. But the thing that, you know, you or I would very likely do is say, give me your data. Yeah, I would love to look at this data. Let me look at it. I will then apply my professional judgment to determine if these are something that ought to be considered and used in the appraisal. And then if I don't use it in the appraisal, I'm going to go in and say, you know, I, I, there were a couple of sales that uh, I considered that I didn't use, and this is why I didn't use them. Because you know darn well if you're coming in below the contract price that uh, there, there's going to be a, maybe a higher level of scrutiny than there would otherwise be. And, uh, and, and so the, the perception of bias... 
is there a political motivation behind some of this? Yeah, there seems to be. Uh, are there things that we can do to, to minimize th uh, that? Yes, we need to be nice to people. We need to treat everyone with respect. We shouldn't share our opinions and conclusions on what we think of someone's property while we're at their home. Uh, and, and we need to you do a better job of uh, making people feel valued while we're doing their work so that it doesn't come across as uh, being, you know, the, well, I don't like you, so I'm going to give you a low value, which is clearly an ethical violation. So in the instance of the particular appraiser who chose not to accept the data from uh, the uh, agent, uh, I think what you're saying then is that appraiser may not have been guilty of racial bias or discrimination, but that appraiser was probably guilty of competency bias. And uh, in refusing the data, uh, very possibly in violation of standard rule 1-4, this says the appraiser will collect, verify and analyze all information necessary for credible assignment results. So it is, is, a, is there such a thing as a competency bias and is what happened between this particular appraiser, this particular developer and this particular agent an example of competency bias? Yeah, I, th I think I think it very likely is. You know, I think I, I think that the Dodd-Frank Act, I I think we have a lot of appraisers who misunderstand, you know, this 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 concept of undue influence. And, and what constitutes undue influence? Well, the reality is that uh, as an appraiser, my, my primary responsibility, my primary objective is to solve the valuation problem that's been placed before me that I've agreed to perform. And I want to look at all the data. I don't care who gives it to me. Uh, in fact, if people tell me about the property and physical characteristics associated with that. I love that. I want to know that. If there was a flood in, you know, in the house or it had termites or there were some circumstances associated with the transaction that influenced the price, I want to know that. And, and oftentimes you simply can't get that information from the MLS. So if an agent's willing to share with me uh, some of the backstory on this stuff, I, I'm delighted to get that. But we've got way too many appraisers who are unwilling to have that conversation. And as a result, I think we suffer a professional, you know, a decline in professional credibility. And, and ultimately, it, it harms the trust that the public should have in us as appraisers, because you get a couple, a very small percentage of people who do things that have you know, in these anecdotal stories of the dual appraisal and one's low and one's high, these hit the national news and all of a sudden the public trust is compromised because there is a perception. I don't know that it's justified, but but there is a perception that the appraisers are biased and, and it, has, it is hurting us in a major way. And the, the, as you say, we don't have the juice from a national perspective to go in and uh, rectify some of that, but but we can, on an individual level, uh, be act more professional, be more courteous, and and do a better job in the work that we perform, and and eventually you will see improvements in in the way that uh, we're perceived as as professionals. So uh, our biggest uh, advocate would be us as appraisers. And indeed, our uh, biggest uh, condemnor apparently is us as appraisers. So I think what you're saying is, uh, well, yeah, there's probably some political motivation someplace along the line, that appraisers themselves are, are going to solve this problem. Not a single organization, not a, an uprising, not a lawsuit against the, the federal government or whatever, but individual appraisers taking it upon themselves to act professionally and then perform professionally is probably the best tool we have 
to uh, end these charges of bias and discrimination. Is it, do I understand correctly? Yeah, that, that's that's what I think. I, I mean, I wished we had the ability as a profession to go in and try to uh, counterman some of these claims that are being made, the indictments that are being made. I, I, I would love to see something like that happen, but I, I don't I don't know how that's going to happen. Uh, I, I would love to see some kind of objective body that could take a more serious look at some of these anecdotal claims with the dual appraisals. And, and and be able to say, yeah, you know, we, we've examined this. And when we look at all of the facts, uh, the, only, the only thing that we can't explain has to be pointing to some kind of bias, or it's not. I, I, I would be surprised if that uh, when you go in and start looking at these appraisals, you know, the case studies that we seem to have out there that unfortunately too much of society takes as fact instead of anecdotal evidence uh, that if we took a hard look at this I think you would very likely find that there are circumstances that may explain why some of these differences exist that have nothing to do with the appraiser's personal bias against the people associated with the property we might find that there is. If there is, those folks should be drummed out of the business or reformed or something. We don't have a space for that kind of behavior to take place uh, within the profession. But the sad reality is we don't know. We, we, it's just society has assumed that these cases are, are based on bias. And this, the, the reality is we simply don't know that they are. And we don't seem to have an appetite as a larger political body to be able, you know, to be willing to go in and take a deep dive and see if there's any substance to these things or not. We just assume that the claims are correct and it kind of flies in the face of due process and innocent until proven guilty and all that stuff. But it's the world we live in right now. And, uh, and so as appraisers individually, we need to be more vigilant in making sure that the work we produce doesn't put ourselves in the sights of someone who wants to, you know, take a take a bite out of us uh, for uh, dumb things we do that we didn't intend to convey the message that sometimes we convey. So I think uh, if I could summarize what you're saying, is that uh, a lousy appraisal is done by yes one appraiser without question, but it tends to reflect on all of us. Now, uh, Craig, if someone needed to get in touch with you. Uh, relative to further questions or perhaps training or something along those lines. How would they go about doing that? You know, you can always just Google me. I'm pretty easy to find on Google. I've got a YouTube channel where we've got a little bit of stuff out there. Uh, just Craig Morley appraiser. Uh, if you want to send me an email, you can send me an email at valuepro at gmail.com. There's no E in value. So it's just V A L U P R O at gmail.com. I'm always happy to hear from people and uh, you know, anytime we can help each other out, I think it uh, boosts us all and makes us all better. So uh, I, I don't claim to know all the answers and I'm always happy to learn stuff. So be delighted to hear from anyone. Craig, thank you. We appreciate it as always. Very informative, uh, very well said, very well spoken and you get right to the issues and we appreciate that. So again, thank you. My best to you and your family as always. And uh, with any luck at all, we'll be seeing each other in uh, Sacramento uh, at the uh, Axe Conference, uh, the, the upcoming Axe Conference, of which we, there will be more uh, on this channel about later. So, Craig, uh, thank you. I appreciate it. Look, looking forward to that. I'm told that I'm going to be a judge. So uh, if you want to watch uh, a little judgment being made on... Uh, rogue appraisers in a mock trial, then, uh, you know, you may want to comment. It's usually kind of fun. Sounds good. We appreciate it. All right, Craig. Thanks. Bye-bye.